This uh, chapter deals with supply contracts and we want to examine uh, how a retailer and a supplier can engage in contract negotiation that would actually benefit the two of them. There are several types of contracts that um, typically uh, a supplier and a, and a retailer will attempt to negotiate but the payoffs for the different contracts will depend on the parameters of those contracts. So we want to try to understand a couple of different supply uh, chain contracts and what the implications are in terms of payoffs, right? Um, the reason why there's a need for contracting, of course, is because typically a retailer would have to obtain supplies or if um, you're talking about a, a manufacturer, a manufacturer may require parts from some several suppliers. So outsourcing uh, sometimes drives this, the need for these sorts of contracts. Significant level of uh, outsourcing uh, seems to be prevalent in how companies function uh, today. Um, we have that um, many of the OEMs, which are basically original equipment manufacturers, they tend to outsource complete manufacturing and design of their products. And so because of this outsourcing relationship, there's a tendency to try to identify manufacturers that could provide the products at a much lower cost. Um, <clears throat> typically what would happen is that the original manufacturer would retain the sort of design expertise but then would outsource the actual manufacturing of the product to contract manufacturers. All right. So OEMs have to get into contracts with suppliers for both strategic and non-strategic components. All right. So what do we mean by strategic components? Um, so if we are attempting to negotiate a contract, there are very important elements of that uh, decision problem. One is, of course, the pricing and volume discounts, so some suppliers will offer different prices for different volumes. Sometimes you can negotiate a sort of a maximum and minimum purchase quantity, um, and that's often necessary because if you allow just about any range of orders to be made, it makes it highly difficult for the manufacturer to optimize capacity utilization in their plants. Um, delivery lead times, of course, would have implications for whether or not a manufacturer can make to stock or can make to order. And because when lead times tend to be long, there's a general tendency to want to make to stock. But when lead times are shorter, then the manufacturer can actually meet the demand requirements on an as-need basis. And in fact, that's what just-in-time is all about, that if you try to reduce um, <clears throat> production lead times, then you are able to meet the demand just in time and you keep lower levels of inventory. Uh, the sort of product or material quality and of course whether or not there are any return policies and so on. So to begin to explore some of these contracts we will take a look at what we call a sequential supply chain. So you have a buyer and a supplier and the buyer's activities generally would be to generate a forecast, determine how many units to order from the supplier and place that order. Um, so the purchase is based on some sort of forecast of customer demand. The supplier, however, has to respond to this and decide um, whether they're going to make to order or make to stock. And it depends on what policy they decide to use. So to begin to explore uh, some of these uh, contracts, potential contracts, we'll consider two-stage situation. So a retailer who faces a customer demand and manufacturer who produces and sells swimsuits to the retailer. So this is a swimsuit example. And uh, you have a sale price of a swimsuit is of $125. The wholesale price paid by the retailer is $80 per unit. Salvage value after the summer session or season is $20. And there's a fixed production cost from the manufacturer's side of $100,000 and a variable production cost per unit of $35. So if you were to look at uh, this problem, because the retailer is paid $80 for this item, the marginal profit is $45, 125 minus 80. All right? And then, of course, 
if they have to sell off, then the marginal loss is $80, which is what they paid, but they're recouping $20. So there's a $60 uh, marginal loss. So as you can see from this situation right here, the marginal profit is actually less than the marginal loss. So there will be a tendency to be conservative in terms of how much you actually order. All right? The manufacturer has a variable cost of $35 per unit, but sells it at $80 to the retailer, which means that there's a $45 profit. And um, if the manufacturer does not actually sell that item and they produced it, then it costs them $35. So if you look at, so the loss is $35, but the profit is $45. So the marginal profit for the manufacturer is higher than the marginal loss. So the manufacturer has an incentive to want to sell as much as possible. Okay. So <clears throat> what is the optimum order quantity? So if you just take a look at some of the sort of parameters of the data here, a retailer marginal profit is the same as the marginal profit of the manufacturer. We've already mentioned that. The marginal profit for selling the unit during the season is 45. is smaller than the loss. And so, therefore, there's a tendency to order less than the average demand. The optimal order quantity depends on the marginal profit and marginal loss, not the fixed cost. The fixed cost just basically moves the total um, revenue curve or expected revenue curve up or down. It doesn't actually change the quantity. Retail optimal policy is to order 12,000 units for an average profit of four seven four hundred seventy thousand seven hundred dollars if the retailer places this order the manufacturer's profit is four hundred and forty thousand dollars so if we add those two together we're somewhere a little over nine hundred thousand dollars actually it'd be nine hundred and um, nine hundred ten thousand dollars is what we and Seven hundred nine hundred ten thousand seven hundred dollars is kind of what we're looking at uh, between those two. So, if we look at this diagram, what this shows is that, based on the product on, on the data on the demand data that we have already given to us, then we could actually compute this curve, where given a particular order quantity. We, this is the, we, we get the expected profit, and at some point this is maximized, and if we go down here, it's been maximized at 12,000 units. Now, if you were to compute the average demand based on the distribution of the demands, the empirical distribution that we have, then we will find the average demand is supposed to be 13,100 units. If you notice here that we actually ordered less than the average demand and that's because the marginal profit is smaller than the marginal loss so you want to actually hold back and um, and be a bit more conservative in the order so if we take a look at here's the data and I've actually given you this uh, particular Excel file the um, here's the distribution of demand. Here are the probabilities. So if we weight the demand by the probabilities, we get what we call the expected demand, 13,100. And we could do our calculations as follows. So depending on the, here's the problem data right here. $80 variable cost, 100,000 fixed cost, selling price 125, salvage value. And we have an Excel template where we've sort of computed for each. So, so here's, here, for, for example, let's just take a look at this case. This is a case where we decide what our production level will be. If we decide it's going to be 5,000 units, then what happens is that we would say the demand, the production is 5,000, but the demand is 8,000. Um, well, you could only sell the 5,000, and you could compute what your profit would be. If we weight all the different profit options by the probabilities, then we get the expected profit. Let's go up here somewhere where we begin to see some differences. Um, so if we look at 10,500 units, 
well, you know, if we if we produce ten thousand five hundred units, or let's just go ten thousand units, ten thousand units, then we we will only we could sell eight thousand with a probability of eleven percent, but ten thousand with a probability of eleven percent as well. However, once the demand goes beyond that, we cannot sell any more because we limited our production to ten thousand. So notice that after the second um, quantity, the profit level remains the same. When we compute, when we weight this, we get an expected profit of $326,900. Well, so for this data, it's, you could see $370,700 is what actually optimizes the expected profit. And it can be seen from this diagram right here. At this point, is a, the series point is for a quantity of $12,000. So what's happening is that this diagram is really a plot of these values right here. Okay, So we will actually be, we could use the Excel spreadsheet to compute the various contract options that we're going to consider as we take a look at this particular problem. Okay. So we're back to our PowerPoint presentation. So one of the things that happens now is that, so you get, you get a, a performance, for, depending on under each contract, the manufacturer makes some money, the retailer makes some money. In this first example that we looked at, where the, in the, the, the manufacturer supplies the retailer, and then the retailer has to do with salvage if there are any products that are not sold. Uh, the retailer or the buyer takes all of the risks. So you see here in the sequential supply chain, the buyer assumes all of the risks of having more inventory than sales. The buyer limits his or her quantity because of the huge financial risk that, that happens here. Supplier takes no risk, so they'll give you whatever you need. So the supplier would like the buyer to order as much as possible because of that situation. And since the buyer limits his or her order, there is a significant increase in the likelihood of a stockout. So we have a stockout risk because of the fact that we have a potential financial risk. If the supplier shares some of the risk with the buyer, you might be able to actually increase the global profit from the supply chain. And so that's what this is all about. Uh, so it may be profitable for buyer to order more, reducing out of stock probability, and increasing the profit for both the supplier and the buyer. So supply contracts enable this sort of risk sharing, and this is where we get into that. So here are a couple of different types of contracts, and the Excel spreadsheet allows us to actually explore those. So I won't go into the nitty gritty, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of reserve that for face to face discussion but the nitty-gritty of the calculations because we could, if we understand the spreadsheet, it basically will allow us to understand the computations that are done. But let's just understand the principles behind the various types of contracts. So in a buyback contract, the seller agrees to buy, which is in this case the manufacturer, to buy back unsold goods from the buyer for some agreed upon price, of course, and you'd have to negotiate that. So the buyer now has an incentive to buy more. So okay, all right, fine. Since you're going to take some back, I'll purchase a bit more. So the supplier's risk is now increased because there's a risk of having to buy stuff back. You're shipping more to your retailer, but you may have to buy some of that back. And then the, of course, the seller's risk. So I mean, the, so the buyer's risk now is now reduced. That is the retailer's risk is now reduced. So they are doing some risk sharing. Increasing the buyer's order quantity as a result, because now the retailer is taking a little less risk, they might be more inclined to purchase more. So therefore, it decreases the likelihood of being out of stock, so that reduces that. And then the supplier is compensated for that higher risk because now they have a larger order. All right? And there's an example that will show that you could get slightly better performance than the sequential supply chain. So if you look, assume that the manufacturer offers to buy unsold swimsuits for $55. So now the retailer has an incentive to purchase more. And the order quantity goes now beyond, beyond um, 
the 12,000 units to 14,000, which is actually larger than the average demand. And let's see why that is. The reason why that is is because the $55 now replaces the $20 salvage value. So if you look at the fact that the retailer purchased the item wholesale at $80 and you subtract $55 from that, then we're looking at the marginal loss in this case is $25, but the marginal profit still remains at 45 So since the marginal profit is now much larger than the marginal loss, that retailer is more inclined to increase their orders. And you could do the computation on this and see that the two parties collectively can make $985,700 compared to $910,000. What's interesting is that both of their profits actually increase. So clearly, when in the first case, when one person took all of the risks, the supply chain was not optimized in that regard. Okay, so that's just the diagram that sort of feeds that. It shows you sort of the cost, the revenue curve for the manufacturer, and the revenue curve for the retailer. But since the retailer is the one making the decision, not the manufacturer, the decision is actually made where the retailer's revenue curve is maximized, and that's somewhere around here, which brings us to the 14,000 units, right? Other types of contracts are revenue sharing contracts. So the buyer shares some of its revenue with the supplier in return for a discount on the wholesale price. So the agreement is, okay, I'm going to give you a discount on the price, but you're going to give me part of that revenue back. So it encourages the retailer to order more as well. So it transfers a portion of the revenue from the stock so back to the supplier. And in, the, in this case, if we take the very same example, we see that we are able to get pretty much the same supply chain profit of 985000 700 but the distribution of the profits actually end up changing so in this example we have a manufacturer agrees to decrease the wholesale price from 80 to 60 all right um, and in return the retailer provides 50 percent of the product revenue to the manufacturer notice that the optimal quantity is still 14,000 and then when we do the computation on that we will get a total supply chain profit of 985700 but the distributions are slightly different. So again, you see the, co the curves, the revenue curves, but it's optimized at this point for the retailer. Um, other types of contracts, quantity flexibility contracts, um, where supplier provides a full refund for return unsold items. So... In a case like that, it almost appears that the supplier now has no risk. So the supplier, not the supplier, the retailer has no risk. So the, the buyer is now taking a fair amount of, of the buyer, but the supplier is taking a fair amount of risk because anything that is not sold by the retailer can be shipped back to the supplier. So the supplier provides a full refund for unsold items as long as the number of returns is no longer so it's no larger than a certain quantity. So you may want to actually limit. Uh, you can't send back everything. So there has to be some sort of um, risk tempering on the part of the manufacturer. So that's understood. It provides a direct incentive for the retailer to increase sales by means of a rebate paid by the supplier for any item sold above a certain quantity. Right? So... These are different types of contracts, again, that we consider. But what if we had the opportunity to optimize the entire chain, an unbiased um, decision maker? Well, so what is the best strategy for the entire chain? So if you could treat the supplier and the retailer as one entity, that means the same company owns both of them, and then you ignore how you divide up the, the cash, then all you need to know is what's the sale price of that item, what's the manufacturing price of that item, and then what's the salvage value. So the sale price would be 125, salvage value 120, and the variable production cost is $35, and that's really all you care about. 
And so in a case like that, the marginal revenue is $90, 125 minus 35. The marginal cost, right, in terms of loss, the marginal loss, so the marginal profit is 90, and the marginal loss is 20, uh, 35 minus 20, which is 15. So you can see here the marginal profit is a lot larger than the marginal loss, so you want to produce as much as possible. So the supply chain will actually increase production to 16,000, even larger than the 14,000, for a total of 1 million, right, 14,500. In that case, you definitely want to look for ways to try to approximate that total supply chain. And so far, we've seen that we've come to 985,700, so we've gotten a little bit close, but can we, in fact, get closer than is possible? Um, you see here, there's some issues with this notion of a global supply chain, uh, con uh, global optimization, sorry, that is very rarely do you have this unbiased decision maker, particularly when the supplier and the retailer are owned by different entities. So it requires a firm to surrender decision-making power to an unbiased decision maker. Um, carefully designed supply contracts can achieve as much as the global optimization. So in other words, the global optimization should be like a target and then you try to figure out contract parameters that will bring as close to that as possible. Global optimization does not provide a mechanism to allocate supply chain profit between the partners because it assumes a single entity. And so how do you share equally or, you know, uh, or for, according to some sort of ratio that would have to be negotiated? And then uh, effective supply chain contracts now allocate profit to each partner in a way that no partner can improve his or her profit by deciding to deviate from the optimal set of decisions. So anytime you deviate from that, you'll actually do worse. So in other words, you are the efficiency frontier is what it is. So this, there are some implementation drawbacks to some of these types of contracts. Uh, in terms of buyback contracts, they require the supplier to have an effective reverse logistics. So if I'm going to buy back, I have to get the products back. It could cost money, in which case it actually reduces the net profit of uh, the manufacturer. So retailers have an incentive to push products not under the buyback contract. Because if I know I'm going to be able to send stuff back to my uh, manufacturer, well, and I don't have a buyback contract with product Y, why, you know, I'm going to try to get rid of those because then I have a sort of a, a hedge against those items that are not sold. Um, so that, while it, in theory, seemed to work fine in terms of improving profit, but once you have an environment where a distributor, a retailer has multiple products that they're selling or competing products, then you run some risk there. Revenue sharing contracts. Well, require suppliers to monitor the buyer's revenue and thus increase administrative costs. So you can't just trust what the retailer will tell you about how much they sold. As a result of that, you want some information on what's, um, what the actual revenues were. And you'd have to negotiate some way of being able to verify the actual revenues. Buyers have an incentive to push competing products with higher profit margins, similar products from competing suppliers with whom the buyer has no revenue sharing contracts. So all these things provide um, sort of limitations. So <clears throat> uh, the previous contract examples were basically make to order. That is, the manufacturer didn't respond until they actually receive an order from the supplier. And uh, so what happens in a case when we're talking about make the stock situations? And then we have an example where make the stock, uh, in the fashion industry, production often begins way in advance because the, the sort of buying season is extremely short. You have um, the decisions around, around production have to be made way early in anticipation of the demand. So that's a make-to-stock system, all right? And so season starts in September, ends in December. Production starts 12 months before the selling season distribution of places orders with the manufacturer six months later, which means six months into the, um, into the year. At that time, the production is complete. Distributor receives firm orders and the distribution of sales 
uh, sells. It says uh, ski jackets to retailers for 125. This should be the page manufacturer 80. So we're using similar, the same sort of problem um, parameters. But the important thing to note is that the production has to take place ahead of time. Okay, so for the manufacturer. The marginal profit is twenty-five dollars. The marginal loss is sixty. So, if your marginal profit is less than your marginal loss, you're definitely not going to want to produce a whole lot. However, the um, the retailer is the one that actually makes the decision. Since the marginal loss is greater than the marginal profit, the distributor should produce less than the average demand, thirteen thousand units. Thirteen thousand one hundred actually is the average demand. How much should the manufacturer produce? Manufacturer's optimal policy, um, 1,200 units, average profit, 160. Distributor's average profit, 510. Manufacturer assumes most of the risk, right? But it's actually trying to limit its production quantity because of the fact that the marginal loss is higher. The distributor takes no risk in a case like that because a make to stock um, so make the stock environment, all right. And and here's the sort of diagram or the function that um, that describes this. And this is part of the uh, Excel template that I've sent you. Payback contract. So what are some of the ways we could actually do some risk sharing in a make to order, not make to order, but a make to stock kind of environment? Well, the buyer agrees to pay some agreed upon price for any unit produced by the manufacturer but not purchased okay because remember the manufacturer is going to have a whole bunch of stuff sitting in stock and then ship when the orders are received so anything that's left behind was not actually purchased so they're willing to pay uh, sort of a payback contract pay for some of those items the buyer's risk now increases increasing production quantities has to compensate the distributor for increasing risk so what would happen now is that the producer is willing to produce more because the buyer will actually pay for items that are not sold. Okay. So in the case here, the distributor offers $18 for each unit produced by the manufacturer but not purchased. So the manufacturer's marginal loss now goes down from $35 right, to now $17. The marginal profit is $25. So since the marginal profit is now larger than the marginal loss, the manufacturer has an incentive to produce more. And so then the production quantity now goes up beyond the 13,000 average demand to uh, 14,000 units. So the manufacturer's profit increases, the distributor's profit also increases a bit as well. A total profit of 705,400 compared with the previous scenario. So both of their profits actually increased of $670,000. And here's the curve that shows both, both situations. Another contract is a cost sharing contract. And uh, so this now, this time now, the buyer shares some of the production costs with the manufacturer in return for a discount on the wholesale price. So the manufacturer would say, sorry, the retailer would say, I'll tell you what, um, if it costs you uh, 55 bucks to produce the item, then I will contribute $10. So what happens is that it reduces the manufacturer's net costs. So the manufacturer is now willing to, um, to produce a bit more. Right, and in this example, manufacturer agrees to decrease wholesale costs from eighty to sixty-two. So the manufacturer does offer the retailer something, reduces the wholesale price, but then the distributor now agrees to pay thirty-three percent of the manufacturer's production costs. The product, so in this case, we produce more than the average demand to fourteen thousand, and now we see the profit. For the two entities, um, now $705,700, same as the profit under the payback contract. So what you begin to notice is that 
you have a number of different types of contracts can actually still yield the same global profit. The issue is what is the distribution of the profit between the partners in the supply chain? That has to be agreed to. So what are some of the implementation issues? Contract sharing requires manufacturers to share production cost information with the distributor. Agreement between the two parties or the distributor purchases. So one of the ways of doing this, uh, because sometimes manufacturers don't want to share that information, so they will say, I'll tell you what, um, I'll purchase one of the items that you need to produce the, pro um, the product. And so essentially the distributor would own that item and ship it to the, the, the manufacturer. And so that's how they, and then they know what they paid for it, so that's how they know the contribution that they're making to the production cost, all right? So uh, components remain on the distributor's books, but are shipped to the manufacturer, manufacturer's facility for production of the finished good, okay? Uh, global optimization in this context, the relevant data is 125, salvage value of 20, production cost of 55. So the, um, we have 125 minus 55 would give us a $70 marginal profit. And then 55 minus 20, a $35 marginal loss, in which case the expected supply chain the quantity is 14,000, optimal quantity, and the expected uh, profit is $705,700. So again, um, the globe, those two contracts that we, we showed earlier actually were able to achieve the same value as the global uh, optimization. But again, the relative distributions are different for the two of them. Okay. So what happens is that information sharing is very crucial for these things to work. Um, so right now we're assuming that the parties actually share the same information, same forecast and so on. But in reality, buyers tend to inflate their forecasts because they want to hedge. So how do you design contracts where the information that is shared is actually accurate so it doesn't cause the manufacturer to produce or to overproduce. So one of the ways to do that is, um, is for what we call a capacity reservation contract. The buyer pays to reserve a certain level of capacity at the supplier. Uh, many of prices are actually offered by the manufacturer. So what happens now is when the buyer makes a decision as to what capacity to reserve, it tends to send information. That's a way of getting information about what the true um, demand likely is. Or well, advanced purchase contract, the supplier charges a special price before building the capacity. And when the demand is realized, the price, is, the price charge is different. Um, so that commitment to just how much capacity that you want to commit to really sends a signal as to what you think the true demand is going to be. So what happens now when we have non-strategic components, um, commodities, that we want to find ways to kind of, you know, keep the prices down. The, in this case, you have a variety of suppliers, market conditions determine, dictate the price. Buyers need to be able to choose suppliers and change them as needed. Long-term contracts have been a, a tradition, but there's a recent trend to more flexible contracts where um, it, in, in the flexible contract, the buyers have different types of options. Uh, that they could exercise later on when they actually have a chance to observe the true demand. And um, it offers effective hedging strategies against shortages. So um, long-term contracts, basically you, you have a fixed commitment. Um, let's negotiate a total volume and a, and a price. So contracts specify a fixed amount of supply delivered at some point in the future. Supply and buyer agree to both price and quantity. The buyer bears no financial risk whatsoever, and takes a huge, the but but takes a huge inventory risk. All right, so you've negotiated a fairly good price, and there's a pretty good chance that you know market conditions might be such that the prices might be higher, spot prices might be higher. But then you got a bunch of stock that you got to make sure that you can get rid of. So uncertainty in demand drives the risk that you could have inventory hanging out there uh, and, and that's, a, that's an issue. Flexible or option contracts 
where the buyer prepays a small fraction of the product up front. So 20%, let us prepay that, and then the supplier comes to reserve capacity at a certain level. That capacity could be more than, of course, what you prepay, but you're just prepaying for a portion of that. And it's sort of, it's kind of a down payment, if you wish. So we call that a reservation price or premium. If the buyer does not exercise the option, then that initial amount is lost. You lose your down payment. And the buyer can purchase any amount up to the option level. That is the capacity that they actually reserved. Paying an additional price or execution price for the amount, any amount over and above that option level. Um, it's usually agreed to at the um, time of the contract and the total price, reservation plus execution price typically tend to be higher than the unit price in a long-term contract. Why? Because of course you want flexibility. It's a way of hedging. So if you're going to hedge financially, then clearly you're going to pay a bit more. All right. Uh, flexible option contracts provide the buyer flexibility to adjust order quantities depending on realized demand, reduces the buyer's inventory risk, shifts risk from the buyer to the supplier because now the supplier is exposed to variations in demand. Um, flexibility contracts, you have related strategy to share risk between suppliers and the buyers. You have to determine ahead of time um, what is the amount that you actually will buy. And the amount to be delivered or paid for can differ by some sort of range. So you could say, I'm going to commit to 1,000 plus or minus 20% of that. So 800 or 1,200. So somewhere you could purchase in a range of 800 to 1,200 at some sort of negotiated price. Sometimes uh, buyers look for additional supply on a open market. Now, that tends to happen because the buyer negotiated a contract, but over and above that contract, there, there's some variation in the demand, and perhaps what was actually reserved was insufficient because the demand was greater. And as a result, the buyer may need to go to the open market, so therefore you pay a spot price. So you use independent e-markets in some cases, or private e-markets to select suppliers. And um, so you drive competition. In that case, you're subject to what the market uh, dictates as the price of the commodity that you're attempting to buy. So there are some risks involved, which is basically the price risk, uh, because you may not be able to influence prices significantly because there was no long-term contract or no option contract. So, given you have these um, uh, different types of contracts that offer different risk hedging um, capabilities, it's possible to negotiate with a number of different suppliers uh, using different types of contracts. So, in essence, what you then develop is a portfolio approach to your supply uh, contracts. So in this case, a buyer signs multiple contracts at the same time. And um, the whole goal is, of course, is to optimize the expected profit and reduce the risk involved. And the contracts will differ depending on who they're contracting with. So they will differ in price and the level of flexibility. They will help to hedge against inventory or shortage or the spot price risk. And you typically would use a portfolio of contracts for commodities where there's usually often a large number of suppliers and each supplier uh, you negotiate a different type of contract with that supplier. So of course uh, there is a, a decision problem which is what is the appropriate mix of contracts that one should have to optimize the risk profile of your contracts. So how much to commit to a long-term contract? And that's your sort of your base level commitment. You commit to 2,000 units. Well, that's kind of like a long-term. How much capacity to buy from companies selling option contract? So you would actually determine what your options level is. How much supply should be left uncommitted? And that's where you're able to actually go to the spot market to negotiate 
um, where possible uh, the, the spot prices. So an, an example of a company that actually used this portfolio of contracts is Hewlett Packard. And they use about 50% procurement costs is invested in long-term contracts, 35% in options, and the balance um, of the 15% in the spot market. All right. So the breakdown of that portfolio will depend will you know be dictated by the the individual companies that choose to use portfolios. No doubt, depending on uh, you know the portfolio mix, there will be trade-offs. So if demand happens to be much higher than anticipated, that means that your base level commitment plus your option level is still less than your demand, then you're going to end up going to the spot market for additional supply. Well, you hope that there aren't uh, shortages because then the prices will be high. If there are no shortages and there's still a, a, wide, a large number of suppliers with available product, then you may be able to get better prices that way. So buyer, the buyer can select a trade-off level between the price risk, uh, shortage risk, and inventory risk by carefully selecting the level of long-term commitment and the option level. For the same option level, and again, think about that. If, so if you keep the levels, the option level the same, right? The higher the initial commitment, the smaller the price risk. So if you have a given option level, say, of 10,000 units, if you're going to commit to 1,000 and one contract compared to 3,000 and another contract, then you would tend to have a smaller price risk if you actually increase your commitment level. The smaller the level of the base commitment, so if we say, for example, we just commit only $1,000 and 1,000 units, the higher the price and shortage risk due to likelihood of using spot markets. So in the case of that, what we're saying is that you, your commitment is small, so there's a pretty good chance you may end up um, needing extra uh, supply, in which case then you might be forced to go to the spot market. So therefore, you have some risk. While you're reducing your inventory risk, you certainly have some risk associated with shortages and some risk associated with prices. For the same, for the same level of base commitment, the higher the option level, the higher the risk assumed by the supplier, since the buyer may choose to only optim um, exercise a small fraction of that option level. So for the same level of base commitment, so what happens is that if you decide to commit to 1,000 units, but in one contract you're considering 10,000 versus 20,000 units, then, of course, in the case of 20,000 units, the supplier is taking a lot more risk because you have to somehow um, be able to provide 20,000 units, but then the buyer may not necessarily exercise that option at all. So there are some risks to the supplier. And this is just a diagram that shows um, the various risk in these different portfolio contracts. So if the option level is low and the base commitment level is low, option level is low, base commitment level is low, then there's a risk, there's some shortage risk, there's some price risk, because more than likely you may find yourself going to the spot market. But if the option level is low and the Sorry, if the option level is high, but the base commitment level is low, then the supply is taking most of the risk. If the option level is low, but the commitment level is high, then the buyer is taking a lot of, uh, a lot of the risk there in terms of inventory. So this sort of gives you a sense of, and it doesn't make sense to have a high option level and a high commitment level. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So this this part of the this quadrant does not really make sense. You, but so you either go for a high as you see here for a given situation either the option level or the base commitment level may be high but not both of them. 
All right, so we, we shouldn't find ourselves in that quadrant at all. So this chapter, just to summarize, just sort of uh, provided us with a sense of the fact that there are different types of contracts that you can negotiate with suppliers, and the different types of contracts have different risk profile. They have different profitability potential, different cost potential. And so buyers have to find the right mix or the right arrangements uh, with their potential suppliers and attempt to optimize the overall supply chain as opposed to simply acting independently to optimize their individual agendas. Thank you.